when a few of us went to the Together for the Gospel conference in Louisville, Kentucky, I was really struck by Mark Dever, the pastor of Capitol Hill Baptist Church. He had a sermon, and the sermon was entitled, False Conversions, the Suicide of the Church. And he opened his sermon with powerful words from the autobiography of Langston Hughes. And because it was so powerful to me, I want to share it with you. I give him credit for this, so I didn't come up with it. Mark Dever did. But I want to read to you the words from Langston Hughes. You may not know who Langston Hughes was. He was an African-American poet. He was instrumental in what was called the Harlem Renaissance during the 1920s. His poetry was very instrumental in the jazz movement. And so this is from his autobiography, a portion called Salvation. So let me read this to you. I was saved from sin when I was going on 13, but not really saved. It happened like this. There was a big revival at my Annie Reed's church. Every night for weeks, there had been much preaching, singing, praying, and shouting, and some very hardened sinners had been brought to Christ. And the membership of the church had grown by leaps and bounds. And my aunt had spoke of it for days ahead. That night, I was escorted to the front row and placed on the mourner's bench with all the other young sinners who had not yet been brought to Jesus. My aunt told me that when you were saved, you saw a light and something happened to you inside and Jesus came into your life and God was with you from then on. She said you could see and hear and feel Jesus in your soul and I believed her. I had heard a great many old people say the same thing and it seemed to me they ought to know. So I sat there calmly in the hot, crowded church waiting for Jesus to come to me. The preacher preached a wonderful rhythmical sermon, all moans and shouts and lonely cries and dire pictures of hell. And the whole building rocked with prayer and song. Still, I kept waiting to see Jesus. Finally, all the young people had gone to the altar and were saved. But one boy in me, he was a rounder son named Wesley. Wesley and I were surrounded by sisters and deacons praying. It was very hot in the church and getting late now. And finally, Wesley whispered to me in a whisper. I'm not going to say what he said because he uses the Lord's name in vain. But he says, I'm tired of sitting here. Let's go up and be saved. So he got up and was saved. Then I was left all alone on the mourner's bench. My aunt came and knelt at my knees and cried while prayers and songs swirled around me in that little church. The whole congregation prayed for me alone in a mighty wail of moans and voices. And I kept waiting serenely for Jesus, waiting, waiting, but he didn't come. I wanted to see him, but nothing happened to me, nothing. I wanted something to happen to me, but nothing happened. Now, it was really getting late, and I began to be ashamed of myself holding everything up for so long. I began to wonder what God thought about Wesley, who certainly hadn't seen Jesus either, but was now sitting proudly on the platform, swinging his knickerbockered legs and grinning down at me, surrounded by deacons and old women on their knees praying. God had not struck Wesley dead for taking his name in vain or for lying in the temple. So I decided that maybe to save further trouble, I'd better lie too and say that Jesus had come and get up and be saved. So I got up. And suddenly the whole room broke into a sea of shouting and they saw, as they saw me rise, waves of rejoicing swept the place. Women leaped in the air. My aunt threw her arms around me. The minister took me by the hand and led me to the platform. When things quieted down and in a hushed silence punctuated by a few ecstatic amens, all the new young lambs were blessed in the name of God. Then joyous singing filled the room. That night, for the first time in my life, but one, for I was a big boy, 12 years old, I cried. I cried in bed alone and couldn't stop. I buried my head under the quilts, my aunt, but my aunt heard me. She woke up and told my uncle I was crying because the Holy Ghost had come into my life and because I had seen Jesus. But I was really crying because I couldn't bear to tell her that I had lied, that I had deceived everybody in the church, that I hadn't seen Jesus, and that now I didn't believe there was a Jesus anymore since he didn't come to help me. How do we respond to stories like that? It breaks my heart as pastor to think that there may be some in this very room this morning sitting here who may profess with their mouth that they have faith in Jesus, but they don't possess in their heart an actual faith in Jesus. I want to address two issues this morning that emerge from the text of Scripture that we're going to deal with, two controversial issues. And I'm just going to lay them out right front We're going to hit these issues head on. Here's the first issue. How important is it to hold spiritual leaders accountable for their teaching? In other words, 
Is there such a thing as zeal without knowledge? And should you as a church member have the right to confront or correct a leader whose theology is off base? That's issue number one. Issue number two, how important is regenerate church membership? Now, what do I mean by regenerate church membership? Let me ask it another way. Is it spiritual suicide to have people in the church that say they are Christians but are really not? Those that act, pretend, may profess to be Christians, but on the inside, they've never truly been saved by grace. They've never repented of their sins. They've never trusted Christ alone for salvation. They've never truly been born again, but they say that they have. Is it the death knoll for the church? Those are the two issues we're going to look at this morning, and I want to tackle them head on as we go through the book of Acts. So let's pick up where we ended last week. If you remember last week... Paul had a fruitful ministry in Corinth. He was able to stay there a year and a half, but then as things wound down, he leaves and finishes his second missionary journey and goes back to Antioch to his home church. So let's pick up in Acts chapter 18, verse 18. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Sincre, he cut his hair for he was under a vow. And they came to Ephesus, and he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they had asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined, but on taking leave of them, he said, I want to return to you if God wills, and he set sail for Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church, and then went down to Antioch, and after spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next, the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollos... A native of Alexandria came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that, he, that, that the Christ was Jesus. Okay, this is the end of Paul's second missionary journey. He's planted the church in Philippi. He's planted the church in Thessalonica. He's planted the church in Corinth. And now he spends a little, a little time in Ephesus. He's going to come back on his third missionary journey to Ephesus. But he heads back home to Antioch, his home church. He takes this vow where he doesn't cut his hair. I don't want to get into all that because most scholars don't know what it's about anyway. And I don't want to bore you with all those details. What I want to really get to is this new character we're introduced to named Apollos. We have this new powerful man. This Jewish man named Apollos. And what do we find out about this man? Well, first of all, we find out from the scriptures that he was from Alexandria. Verse 24, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria. Alexandria was the second largest city in the Roman Empire. It was a powerful city. It was the intellectual center of the Roman Empire. There was schools and universities. As a matter of fact, there was a 400,000 volume library in Alexandria. So this was a place of learning, a place of education, a cosmopolitan center that Ale- of Alexandria where Apollos is from. Now, we really don't know how Apollos got saved. We don't know how he trusted Christ for salvation. We know that probably he heard the gospel, he repented of his sins, he believed in Jesus, and then he decided to go travel around to Jewish synagogues in the known world to preach and teach. And so he comes to Ephesus, and he's preaching. He's an eloquent man. Notice it says he was an eloquent man. He was competent in the scriptures. In other words, here you have a highly intelligent, very articulate man that is very persuasive when he stands up and preaches. You want to hear what he has to say. We have people in our day like that. Take your pick of preachers, whether it's R.C. Sproul or John Piper or John MacArthur or Sinclair Ferguson or, or Franklin Graham, whoever it is that's your favorite person that you, that you listen to their podcast or you download their sermons, you want to listen to them. This was Apollos. He was a highly intelligent, highly articulate, very competent 
powerfully speaking man. He was, he was articulate. And it also says something about his character. It says he was fervent in spirit. In other words, he was on fire for Jesus. He was passionate when he spoke. He was a passionate, highly intelligent, competent man that was a very powerful speaker. He was anointed by God. He had the ministry uh, of the anointing of God upon his life. He was on fire. He spoke accurately the things about Jesus. Okay, so when it came to Jesus, he, he knew the virgin birth. He knew the substitutionary atonement. He knew the sinless life of Christ. He knew the resurrection. But in the old words of get smart from the 60s, Missed it by that much. As great a teacher as he was, as powerful a speaker as he was, as as on fire for Jesus as he was, as articulate as he was, he had a deficiency in his theology. There were some gaping holes in his theology. Notice what it says here. He only knew of the baptism of John. He hadn't realized that there was such a thing as Christian baptism. And so it was kind of confusing for him to be teaching the baptism of John the Baptist. Now, what was John the Baptist's baptism? It was, it was a forerunner type of baptism. John the Baptist was a forerunner of Jesus. He came preaching repentance, and people were baptized by John the Baptist as a way to prepare for the coming Messiah. It was strictly mainly for the Jews. But after Pentecost, what has happened? After the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus at Pentecost, there's Christian baptism. It's baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, immersed, and then there is this idea that it's not just for Jews, but it's for all peoples, Gentiles and Jews. And so it would have been very confusing for this powerful man to be preaching, to be persuasive, to be on fire for Jesus, to be articulate, and not have all his theological ducks in a row. And so what he was saying was not necessarily inaccurate per se, it was just incomplete. It wasn't complete. And so here's the issue. Zeal without knowledge can be dangerous. Can be dangerous. A gifted speaker can do more harm than good if he's not all the way there theologically. So what do you do with a person like this? This gets a little touchy. At first glance, it looks like they're doing everything right. They're a gifted speaker, they're opening their Bible, they're passionate about Jesus, you want to listen to them, they know what they're talking about, they're highly intelligent, they're not an outright heretic, they're not preaching heresy, they're not necessarily a false teacher, but but maybe 90% of their theology is good, it's that other 10% that you're like, "Eh, I'm not sure about that, or maybe it's 80-20, but they're not this outright heretic, that they haven't walked into town with a name badge saying, I'm a false prophet, I'm a wolf in sheep's clothing, stay away from me. This is a person that genuinely loves Jesus, has the anointing of God on his life, is preaching and teaching. How do you deal with people like that? Do you call them out publicly? Do you call them on the carpet? Do you write a nasty email to them? Do you, do you, do you post a blog blasting them as a heretic? How do you deal with a person that has a lot of zeal, a lot of passion, but's not quite all the way there theologically? How do you do that? Well, how did Priscilla and Aquila do it? In verse 26, We find out. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him. Now, the original language there, the ESV says they took him. In the original Greek, it really says they took him aside privately. They took him aside privately, and they explained to him the way of God more accurately. So what did they do? They didn't blast him publicly in the synagogue and say, hey, Apollos, you're wrong. Get off the stage. No, they pulled him aside privately and they said, Apollos, you've got some gaps. You've got some holes in your theology. Let's let's walk beside you. Let let me teach you. Let's come alongside you. I'm going to gently confront you, but I'm going to do it in private. F.F. Bruce, one of the greatest uh, New Testament historians of last century, said this, How much better it is to give such private help to a preacher whose ministry is defective than to correct or denounce him publicly. Now, here's the issue with Apollos. He's not a false teacher. He's not a false prophet. He's not a heretic. He's a godly, intelligent, powerful speaker. He genuinely wants to preach the truth. He's opening the Bible. He knows about Jesus, but he's not quite all the way there yet. And they go in private. And what does it say there? They explain the word of God more accurately. Really, in the original language, what that means there, when you look at that word, they explain it more accurately. Literally, it means they filled in the gaps. They filled in the blanks. Now, I've been there as a young pastor before, okay? 
Early in my ministry, in my early 20s, mid-20s, in the, in the early and mid-90s, I did not have all my theological ducks in a row. I, I'm embarrassed to think about some of the things I believed and said back then. Okay, and so I was an immature, but I loved Jesus. I, I don't think I was a heretic. I wasn't a false teacher. I just may have had like 80% right and 20% that wasn't quite right, and I would have been devastated. I would literally have been devastated if my pastor or my father or somebody I respected called me out publicly on the carpet and just blasted me in front of other people. I would have been devastated as a young, as a young minister. But these guys took me aside privately and said, hey, Sean, here's some things you may need to deal with. Here's some issues you may need to look at. They gently walked beside me, and that's what Priscilla and Aquila did with Apollos. And see, that actually happened to me one time. As a youth pastor, I was teaching one Wednesday night, and I, it, was a, it was a minor theological point. I don't even think it was a big deal, but a parent was sitting there. And publicly, he called me out and said, you're wrong. Okay. And he began to rebuke me and correct me in a very hostile way in front of the youth. And it basically cut me to the quick. I was embarrassed. I was mad. I was upset. I lost all credibility in that moment. I felt like an idiot. And what he should have done is come privately afterwards and said, you know, we don't see eye to eye on this issue. You may have said it like this, or maybe, you know, have you considered this? But to stand up in the middle of a worship service or in the middle of a teaching and just to blast the guy and say, you're wrong, you're a heretic, that can wound a young pastor. And think about the immaturity of Apollos. I mean, he's coming full guns blazing. He's preaching his heart out. He loves Jesus. And if Apollo, if Aquila and Priscilla would have stood up in the synagogue and said, Apollos, you don't know what you're talking about, that would have crushed him. So they took him aside privately and they dealt with it. They dealt with it. And now here's the issue. If a person's an outright heretic, okay, they're a false teacher, they're, they're a shady charlatan, they're a greasy televangelist, you can rebuke them, okay? I give you permission. You can call them out publicly. You can rebuke them. You may take some extreme measures. You've got to stand up for truth. If they're an outright heretic, get in their face and confront them, okay? I give you permission, even if it's public. Sometimes that's appropriate. But if they're just an immature Christian and they're in the process of learning and they, and they have good intentions and their heart's pure and they're wanting to preach the truth, it may be more appropriate to pull them aside privately and say, you know what? In gentleness, with the fruit of the Spirit, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to show you some deficiencies in your theology. Let's talk about this. Let's walk through it. Let's be gentle. Let's deal with it in private. About five or six years ago, this happened to me. This very church, not this church building, we're in the other building. A couple came in to see me and they had an issue with my preaching, which I'm sure a lot of people do have an issue with my preaching. You're still here this morning after all these years, so hopefully you're you're okay with that. But they addressed an issue. It wasn't a theological issue. It was an issue related to an attitude I had in my preaching. And at first when it came, it stung. I didn't want to hear it. But then as they left and as I prayed about it and I processed it, I realized that, you know what, they're, they're probably right. And so I repented and I prayed about it and I, and I changed some things in my preaching because of that private conversation that a couple had with me. Now, they could have called me down in the middle of worship service and said, Sean, change your attitude. I would have been like, whoa, that's probably not the best way to handle it. So here's the issue. Paulus was teachable. He received the correction. How did he respond? Notice what happened. His ministry got even more powerful. In verse 27, when he got his, when the, when the blanks were filled in, when the holes were filled in, when, his, when the theological gaps were gently corrected by Aquila and Priscilla, uh, verse 27, when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. He had a great ministry. That word there that says he powerfully refuted, in the original language, it means he overwhelmed people with a strong argumentation. He became what we call an apologist. He had the ministry of apologetics. Now, apologetics doesn't mean you apologize for your faith, okay? Sometimes you hear, I'm going to study apologetics. That means we have to go around apologizing that we're Christians. That's not what it means. Apologetics comes from the Greek word prosopologion, which means to give a defense, to, to refute and so here's what, here's what an apologist does. An apologist is a highly intelligent person that studies really extensively and researches so that they're able to refute things like atheism or Islam or, or evolution or false belief systems. They're able to articulate clearly with argumentation what the truth of Scripture is. And we have some powerful people in our day who are apologists, people like Ravi Zacharias or, or my former professor, James White, men who have a specific ministry of being an apologist. They, they defend 
defend the truth. They, they powerfully refute arguments by using a reason and logic and say that their ministry is different than a pastor, okay? Paul was a church planning pastor. He went from church to church to plant churches. He was a missionary. His ministry was different. Apollos was an apologist. He stood up and he powerfully refuted the Jews in the synagogues. Two great men of God in Corinth used to do ministry, but in different ways. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 7, because in Corinth, Apollos had a ministry in Corinth, and as we'll see um, last week, Paul had a ministry in Corinth. Here's what happens. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, okay, Paul planted the church. Apollos watered, he came along after Paul left, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. So two men used by God to, to affect that church in Corinth. And so the first issue is you as a church member, you do have the right and the privilege and the responsibility to confront doctrine of your leaders. But you need to be very discerning to make sure that if it's an outright heresy or is it just some things that may be not necessarily wrong, but maybe off a little bit. How do you do that? Do you do it with gentleness? Do you do it with respect? Do you do it in private? Do you do it in a way that doesn't crush that leader, but loves that leader? You still got to confront them, but how did Aquila and Priscilla do it? They did it in private. They walked us along Apollos, and it strengthened his ministry. He was stronger because of it. Now, here's the second issue that I want to look at this morning. We move into chapter 19. Apollos was a Christian who just didn't have all the information. In Acts chapter 19, we have these 12 men that think they're Christians, but they're really not. They're false converts until Paul comes and shows them the true way of salvation. So let's jump into chapter 19 and see as Paul, Paul's starting his third missionary journey, okay? Paul is going to Ephesus. Apollos camps out in Corinth. Paul goes to Ephesus. We will talk about Ephesus in the coming weeks because it's a very important church. He spends three years there. It's mentioned in five books of the Bible. You've got it right here in Acts. You've got the book to Ephesians, First and Second Timothy. Paul, uh, P Timothy was the pastor to the book, pastor to the church in Ephesians in the book of Revelation. It's the church that's first addressed by Jesus as the seven churches. So the church in Ephesus is very important. But for our purposes, we're just going to look how Paul walks into town. So, so let's look at uh, chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we've not even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There was about 12 men in all. Second question. First question was, do you as a church member have a right to confront those or hold people accountable that are spiritual leaders for their teaching? Yes, you do. Second question. Are false converts the suicide of the church? those that claim to be Christian. Now, here's the interesting thing. Paul comes into town, and the wording is ambiguous. He comes into town, and he comes to some disciples. Okay? Ambiguous. They're, they're disciples. And Paul wants to give them the benefit of the doubt, and so Paul says, okay, I'm assuming you're Christian. You look like Christian. Uh, you, you said you're a disciple. Let me, let me ask some questions to find out your true spiritual condition. So Paul asks the first question. What's the first penetrating question Paul asks them? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, you have to ask the question, why did Paul ask that? Could it be that they were claiming to be disciples but showed no fruit of the Spirit, showed no evidence of the Holy Spirit, showed no evidence of regeneration, said they were disciples, but there's no evidence? Why would Paul ask that question if there wasn't any evidence of salvation? And what's their answer? Never even heard of the Holy Spirit. Now, at first glance, you've got to say, now, What? You've got to be joking. What do you mean you've never heard of the Holy Spirit? Can a, Christian, can a person become a Christian without the Holy Spirit? And the answer is no. 
The Holy Spirit's the one that regenerates us. The Holy Spirit's the one that saves us. The Holy Spirit's the one that opens our eyes. And so, so you have to be asking the question, are these guys living in a time warp? Because the Old Testament talks about the, old, the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist himself even talked about the Holy Spirit. So were these guys totally ignorant that there was a Holy Spirit or was it the fact that they were ignorant that now Jesus had come, he had died, he'd rose again, and Pentecost had come where the Holy Spirit was poured out and now the Holy Spirit comes and indwells and lives inside all believers. Was that what they were unaware of? Because in Luke 3.16, John the Baptist told them, if these are disciples of John the Baptist, listen to what John the Baptist said. John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So these disciples knew there's one coming, Jesus, and he's going to truly baptize you, i.e., you're going to get saved. You're going to experience regeneration. And so really, the issue is these guys are living in a time warp. And so Paul asked them a second question. Okay, if you guys never heard the Holy Spirit, into, into what then were you baptized? Were you baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Christian baptism? They said, no, we were only baptized into John's baptism. And Paul says, John's baptism is is pointing to Jesus, but it's not Christian baptism. It's a a baptism of repentance for Jews, but but John was pointing to the true Christ, the the Messiah, the one who died and rose again, and and now Pentecost has been been poured out, the Holy Spirit's been poured out, and so that's really the truth of the gospel. You see, they're living in the shadows of the Old Testament. They're living in the shadows of the Old Testament. They thought they were secure because they'd gone through a ritual. What had they done? They got dunked. They got wet. And Paul's basically saying, so what? You can get wet and not truly receive the Holy Spirit and be saved. They were putting their faith in a ritual. There are a lot of rituals you can put your faith in, people. I walked an aisle when I was four years old. I raised a hand at the end of a service when the evangelist told me to raise my hand. I prayed a prayer asking Jesus into my heart. I signed a card saying I want to be a Christian. I got dunked in the waters of baptism. I joined a church. I went through confirmation. Whatever ritual it is that you do, if you're trusting in that ritual to save you, your trust is in the wrong place. Those rituals do not save you. Christ alone saves you. And obviously these men had not been saved because Paul says on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and then when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. How can you be a Christian without the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit had not yet come into their life. They were trusting in a religious experience. They were putting their faith in a ritual that they weren't actually saved. And because these guys are kind of living in a time warp, they get to experience Pentecost part two, okay? They weren't there for Pentecost, didn't know about Pentecost, so God in his sovereignty says, okay, I'm going to give you guys Pentecost. Speak in tongues, prophesy, you get to to experience this. It's like Pentecost kind of caught up with them. So how do we respond to the issue of false conversions? People who think they're Christians, people who've gone through a religious exercise, people who've gone through a ritual, people who have done all the churchy things, but they never have truly been born again. They've never truly been soundly saved. How do you deal with that? Because it's a dangerous thing. Our churches are filled with people, week in and week out, that profess faith in Christ, but don't possess faith in Christ. It's a scary thing. Because you can fool a lot of people. You can do a good job at a fake. If you know Christianese, if you know the the routine, especially if you've grown up in a Christian home, you can play play the game pretty easily. And walk in and walk out and act like you're a Christian and never be soundly saved. Listen to A.W. Tozer. It's my opinion that tens of thousands of people, if not millions, have been brought into some kind of religious experience by accepting Christ and they've not been saved. Are there places in the Bible that teach this truth? Yes. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew. Let's listen to Jesus himself. So let's turn to Matthew. I want you to see it with your own eyes, the words of our Savior, Matthew 13. You're very, very familiar with this story that Jesus tells. It's the parable of the sowers. Matthew chapter 13, look at verse 18. Verse 18. 
And Jesus point blank tells us there's such a thing as false converts. As a matter of fact, Jesus predicts it's going to actually happen. Matthew 13, 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand that the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart, this was what was sown along the path. And for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and automatically receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word, understand it, he indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, in another thirty. Four soils. Only one is saved. The fourth soil. Why? That person hears they understand there's root, and then they bear fruit. The other three heard, and they may have got excited. They may have jumped for joy and said, I love Jesus. Or they may have signed a card. They may have walked an aisle, and they may have got dunked. But here's the issue. It says there was no what? Root. There was no salvation. And it proved itself because when the cares of the world and the temptation of the world and the trials of the world and all the things of this world come in to choke it out, it proves the fact that they weren't saved in the first place. And so without the fruit of or the root of salvation, there's no fruit of salvation. And so Jesus says, there will be many who appear to be Christian, but there's no root. There's no salvation. There's no true regeneration. And there's no evidence of that in fruit. Let's keep going because Jesus explains it even further. Let's look at the next parable, verse 24. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servant of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus says within the visible church, those that claim to be Christian, there will be true believers, the wheat, and there will be weeds or tares right alongside, and they look just like you each other one difference on that final day the wheat will the weeds will be exposed as false and they will end up in hell jesus says, expect there to be false converts in your midst those that claim to be christian though that though that act like christians those that talk like christians but they they're never they've never truly repented now turn over to Matthew 7 for a moment, and I want you to hear the scariest words of Jesus. Every time I read this, I shudder, and you should shudder too. You should shudder. Matthew seven twenty one. It's towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Listen to the words of our Savior. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you in the first place. I never knew you. But I went on a mission trip, Jesus, in 1985. I never knew you. When I got baptized last year, I never knew you. I walked forward at the end of Pastor Sean's service. I never knew you. When my best friend told me about Jesus, I never knew you. Have you trusted Christ alone for salvation? Should this concern you as a church member? Should we allow into membership or baptize people who have no evidence of regeneration or salvation do you realize that every person that goes through our membership process in our membership class has to fill out a questionnaire 
They have to fill out a questionnaire explaining to us as elders their salvation experience. And we usually talk with them or I talk with them and if you cannot articulate your salvation experience, then there's a problem. And as elders, we're not trying to be legalistic by looking into people's hearts and trying to predict who's Christian or not. I can't do that. But we are called to create a process whereby we know that if we're accepting people into membership, they are saved. Is it 100% foolproof? No. People can slip through the cracks, but we've got to, as good elders, have a process. Let me tell you how I grew up, and maybe you grew up this way. I grew up in Southern Baptist churches where at the end of the service, the pastor would give the altar call, a family would come down, they would pray a 30-second prayer, the pastor would turn them around to the congregation and say, let's all accept them into membership and give a hearty amen, and right there on the spot, people were pronounced saved and in membership of the church, and the pastor may have had a 30-second conversation with them, didn't know them from Adam, but they are members of the church right then and there. That, to me, is scary. Who knows if that person's not a Mormon? Or that person's living in flagrant sin, or that per we don't know. So we'd rather err on the side of taking time, asking questions, clearly presenting the gospel, laying it all out front so that we understand that if you are going to be a member of Emmanuel Baptist Church, you can clearly articulate the fact that, yes, I've been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I am saved. Mark Dever preached that message at Together for the Gospel, and he made a statement that really stuck with me. False converts end up hiring false teachers. In other words, if you have a church of unregenerate church members and it comes time to hire the next pastor and they're not believers but think they are, chances are they may hire a false teacher. And then that is the suicide of the church. And I'm thankful that if I were to leave this afternoon and get hit by County Express and die on Main Street or I get incapacitated in some way and you had to hire a new pastor, I am very confident if God took me out because of our elders, because of you being taught, because of the, the health of this congregation, you would take great pains, you would create, take great time in prayer to make sure that the next guy that stands in this place knows his stuff and it's theologically accurate. If you're here today and you aren't sure that you're saved, let me give you two verses. 2 Corinthians, 15, or 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Christ Jesus is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Examine yourselves. 2 Peter 1, 10. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election Sure. Let me introduce to you a book that's a great resource. I've got 11 of these available after the service. It's called, Am I Really a Christian? Am I Really a Christian? Let me give you some of the, the, the book, the, the chapters here. Chapter 1, you're not a Christian just because you say that you are. Chapter 2, you're not a Christian if you haven't been born again. Chapter 3, you're not a Christian just because you like Jesus. Chapter 4, you're not a Christian if you enjoy sin. Chapter 5, you're not a Christian if you do not endure to the end. Chapter 6, you're not a Christian if you don't love other people. Chapter 7, you're not really a Christian if you love your stuff. And chapter 8, can I really ever know if I'm a Christian? If you're struggling with this issue, these books will be available at the back. I don't want you to come get a book because you want a new book to read, okay? You, you bibliophiles that like books, this is for people that either you have a person in your life that needs to read this or you've come in here today and you ask that question, am I really a Christian? Now we're asking you to make a suggested donation for maybe 10 bucks or whatever, but if you can't afford that, just take the book. Here's where the rubber meets the road in today's message. You have a high and holy responsibility for two things as church members. One, you've got to ensure that your spiritual leaders are theologically accurate. You have every right and responsibility to confront, to correct. Just do that with gentleness and with compassion. That's responsibility number two. Number one, responsibility number two, you have the high and holy calling to make sure that those that we bring into membership are regenerated church members. And how do you do that? Well, you've got to be in the Bible yourself. You've got to know the scriptures. You've got to be in this like the Bereans we talked about a few weeks ago that examined this with diligence every day to see if it was true. You see, the health of the church is dependent upon the health of the leaders of the church. 
And the overall health of the church in the long run is dependent upon having people in the church that are really Christians. It's scary to think about. Do you, do you realize? Okay, I'm going to start preaching now, okay? So just be prepared. There are apostate denominations and churches in our country right now that have the name church on their building, but they are not churches because they've abandoned the gospel, they've abandoned the truth, they have unregenerate people in there, they have false prophets and teachers, but they're still operating as a church. Don't think it can't happen to this church. It's happening in droves all over our nation. I don't want to walk out of this room today and have a bunch of Langston Hughes that went through a religious experience to please a family member or to get off the hot seat or to try to appease their conscience, but lied about it the whole time, knowing they were lying about it. Please, from the bottom of my heart, with tears, as your pastor, repent and believe in Jesus today. And let me speak to a special group of people. Let me speak to children, youth, and young adults that have been here the last seven years of my ministry. You have no excuse. You've sat under the preaching of the gospel week in and week out in this church. You've sat under Trevor Christian and Andrew Hayes week in and week out hearing the gospel. You've sat under your Sunday school teachers. You've sat under your team kid leaders. You've sat under your cubbies leaders. You've sat under teaching week in and week out. You've heard the gospel. You do not get into heaven by being a good kid on your parents' coattails, by trying hard. You become a Christian by repenting and believing in Jesus Christ, and you've heard it week in and week out. I can't make you believe in Jesus, but when you walk out those doors, there's no excuse because you've heard it, and it breaks my heart to think that after seven years of me standing up here presenting the gospel that there would be children and youth at this church that would walk out that door and say I never knew you it breaks my heart and all I can ask you to do is to to repent repent today there may not be a tomorrow the Bible says today, if you hear the word of the Lord, do not harden your heart. Let me ask you to bow your